Welcome back to our series on multivariable calculus. In this episode, we're going to look at vector fields. That is, an entire configuration of vectors that might represent an electric field or a magnetic field, a gravitational field. It might represent a temperature gradient or the forces of stress and strain inside a physical structure. Vector fields are deceptively simple in terms of their notation. Basically, it's a vector, f of x, y for the x component, and g of x, y for the y component. And this vector represents two things simultaneously. It represents the locations of every vector in the field. So when you substitute in values of x and y, you'll get the location where each vector is located in the xy plane. It will simply be an fg coordinate. In addition, f and g represent the two components of the vector at that location. So if you find their magnitude and direction, you can also place the tail of the vector at the location fg indicates, and then the direction and magnitude of the vector trailing off from that point. Clearly, if we graphed every possible vector in the vector field, it would create a mess. Each vector would be on top of each other. It would fill in the space so that you couldn't really see them. So in order to make a vector field viewable, we tend to just basically graph every few vectors within the field, enough to give us a good sense of the direction and magnitude of the vector field. As the vectors get larger, the field's magnitude increases, and as they start to converge and point in directions, a lot of information can be gathered from a good vector field. We can spot asymptotes and nodes, places where the forces are pointing towards or away from. Let's take a look at a really simple example of a vector field. The simplest one I can think of is just the vector field xy. The nice thing about it is the ordered pair xy will indicate where the vector is located. If f and g are functional in x or y, often the input doesn't actually equal the location. But in this case, it does. So it makes it rather easy to graph. So let's start with an x, y axis and consider the behavior of this particular vector field. Well, we know that as x and y get larger, the magnitude of the vector x comma y will also get larger. So what this predicts is right here at the origin, the vector field is going to have a magnitude of zero because not only is the location 0, 0, but the magnitude of that vector will be 0, 0. But if we move slightly off of the origin, say into the first quadrant, then of course we're going to get a vector x, y, that's at location x, y, very close to the origin, but it will in fact have a very small magnitude because the coordinates for x and y close to the origin are rather small. If I move to the other side of the y-axis, of course, all the x components are zero. So the equivalent vector in this, in this co uh, coordinate or quadrant would actually point up and to the left. If we go into the third quadrant, both the x and y components will be, zero, will be negative. So while we're at that location, we'll definitely be pointing away from the origin. And of course, the same thing in the fourth quadrant will point down and away. Okay, so those represent sort of our initial points. And as you can see, these vectors are quite small, indicative of the fact that this field is very weak near the origin because its magnitude is based on how far it is from the origin. Pretty easy to see that the origin represents a node from which all the vectors in the field will flee. So as we move further away, the vectors will increase in size, but will always point radially from the origin outward. And so it's pretty easy to construct this vector field just by picking a few key locations and drawing vectors that are roughly equivalent to the magnitudes we would expect at these various radiuses. And generally, a sketch of a vector field is intended to be just that, a sense of how this force field operates if, in fact, it represents forces. This could also represent temperatures, where the temperature was very cold at the center and reaches larger and larger magnitudes as we move outward. Okay, so there's a simple representation of a vector field, and of course the vector field itself was rather simple. When vector fields get complex, it becomes a little bit harder in order to graph them. 
not only are the input values that you put in for x and y often dramatically different from the locations of those vectors, but sometimes the magnitudes are complex and difficult to calculate. So for most vector fields, what we want to do is sketch a few close to the origin and then move further away. But most vector fields are going to defeat us if we try and graph them manually. Instead, we're going to immediately revert to some technological solution. Okay, the first method in order to uh, sketch these vector fields is provided by this uh, GeoGebra app. And this one's already been pre-programmed for us. I'll link the, uh, the URL to it, both in the video description as well as on the course homepage. Uh, and it's pretty easy to use. You simply enter in the X and Y components of the vector field that you're after. So suppose we wanted a simple one like XY. It displays the vector field here. It shows you a graph of the vector field. <clears throat> you can change the parameters for X and Y here. Uh, here you can uh, control basically the, uh, the size and density of the arrows created by it. So again, we can uh, increase the density in the y direction, increase the density in the x direction, and then here we can make the longest vectors longer. So we're, we rescale the field, and here we just make the arrowheads bigger or smaller. Depending on how many there are, it can tend to overwhelm. So it's a really nice app, and it allows you to sketch almost uh, any vector field as long as uh, negative 5 to 5 will really show you everything you're interested in. So that's our first example. Okay, the second method by which we can sketch these vector fields technologically is by using the Sage cell. This is the one that's actually embedded inside of your textbook, but of course you can go to the Sage cell website and do the same thing. Uh, all we do is, is utilize the plot vector field function. Uh, it next asks you for the definition of the vector field and then the ranges for the x and y value. And then fig size controls uh, the density of the arrows. So if you increase or decrease that, you get more arrows. Let's take a look at the field we just did, uh, x squared versus y. Or just, actually, let's just do x, y. So x and y for the y coordinate, and then we evaluate. And there it is. It's the same vector field that we saw generated with GeoGebra. So both of these are excellent technical solutions in order to resolve difficulties where the vector field is just too complex to manually graph it.